I was a kid, I remember uh, watching Merv Griffin. Anybody remember Merv Griffin? And uh, if you're under, I don't know, 52, you may not know <laughs> Merv Griffin. Uh, just think, if you don't know who Merv Griffin is, just think Phil Donahue. That'll help, right? That's even worse. Think of, I don't watch daytime uh, talk show. Who's that? Oprah Winfrey, is she still doing her thing? Is she? Okay. And uh, there's some country star doing this too, right? Maybe I'm off. Okay. But Merv Griffin, he, he had a guest. He, he had like a Mr. Olympus bodybuilder guy. Some of you have heard this story because it's one of my favorites. But, uh, and uh, Mr. Olympus came out onto the stage and did his, you know, four-minute Mr. Olympus routine, right? And, did, and there was the music playing and there. And, uh, and then it ended, and the crowd went wild. And he walked over to where the guests, you know, and Merv is sitting at his desk. And, and Merv asked the bodybuilder, Mr. Olympus, he said, so glad you're here. What, what are those muscles for? And so Mr. Olympus stood and kind of gave one of these. And Merv said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know that, but what's, what are they for? And so then he stood up again and kind of did the highlight of his Mr. Olympus routine. And a third time, you know, Merv said, but what are they for? And Mr. Olympus kind of looked blankly back at him. What are they for? You have muscles, you think that the muscles are for something. They have a purpose, right? Maybe that was the purpose. Great question. As we are on the home stretch of our Oh My Soul series, I, I want you to think with me today what is this flourishing soul for? Now, I'm not assuming that your soul is uh, perfect and, you know, no problems. You know, you're probably still struggling in life because that's kind of the nature of life. But if you're walking with Jesus and if you've been tracking and growing in Christ these days, you begin, can begin to seriously feel your soul begin to uh, relish the presence of God, to enjoy life, and to flourish. You can begin to feel that. And if your soul is beginning to flourish, and if you have a, a soul that's walking with Jesus and is flourishing, the question this morning is, what is your flourishing soul for? We've been using this diagram from uh, Dallas Willard because it's helpful for us in thinking about what exactly is the soul. There's a lot of confusion on what a soul is. We know that it's eternal. It just kind of has uh, that kind of weight. It's a very short word, but it's a weighty word. You know, oh, my soul, right? And so to think about the soul, what is it? And so we've used this through the weeks just to think about the different parts of us that are identifiable. And all of the parts of us, our mind, our body, our you know, relationships, all of, all of that we, all that we are makes up us, and that is our soul. The soul is the total part of you. It's all of you together. And so when the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, it's like all that is within me, bless your holy name. Right? That's the soul. And if your soul is flourishing, when your soul flourishes, this is what we've been saying, it's when there's congruence, you know, there's harmony between all the parts of you, your thinking and your body and your relationships, right? All of you is kind of of the same. It's congruent. There's not a dark side of you. You're, you're one whole person. And uh, this is a, uh, you know, tangibly, it's a result of salvation. You, you won't become a whole soul without the presence of God in your life, to be congruent and whole and healthy and vibrant, you need the one who made you and who knows how you are all put together, how he knit you together and the person that he's created you to be. But if you're doing that, if you're yielding to God, if you're following him, if you've placed your soul under his loving care and you trust him, you've entrusted yourself to him, if you understand the frailty of your flesh and how prone you are to wander, from this relationship with God, if you're relying on the love that God has for you, if you're loving others and put, giving preference to others above yourself, even loving and praying for your enemies, right? If you're, if you're humble of heart and you're relinquishing to God the outcomes of your life, these, this is the pathway. These are the things that result in an integrated whole person flourishing in the presence of God. And although we're not done yet, I understand. In the pursuit of this, what's it all for? 
What is a flourishing soul for? What is your soul that's flourishing? What's the purpose of that? If you're thinking, well, I know where I've come from, and I'll tell you what, it is a blessing to me to have an integrated whole soul. And your answer may be, well, my flourishing soul is to be a blessing to me. And I would say to you, you're right. It is a great blessing to us when we are integrated and whole and flourishing. We are blessed, and the people around us are blessed as we are flourishing in that way. And certainly the good news of Jesus that we celebrate so regularly, you know, as we celebrate what Christ accomplished for us on the cross and as we celebrate being sons and daughters of the Most High God, as we live in this grace that he's given to us, it is an absolute blessing to us. Jesus said he came that we might have life and have it to the full. So yes, the flourishing soul is to be a blessing to us. But my friends, I want to suggest to you today that in the answer to that question, it's third on the list. And if it's not rightfully third on the list, if the first and second things that your flourishing soul is for, if it somehow you know, rises in importance and the answers to that question, the irony is if you get that a flour- if you get this, a flourishing soul is a blessing to me, if you get it out of order, your soul will actually begin to languish. Because the blessing, you know, the blessing, and we begin to focus on the blessing of me, and you can see where it heads, right? We'll see some of that in a minute. If we elevate the blessing of our lives to the first or second answer, our souls will languish. There's a great passage in Mark chapter 8 I'm going to use today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Uh, or you can read it on the, on the screen too. In Mark chapter 8, right in the you know, middle of Mark's gospel, and Jesus has done some miracles, and then it says that he and his disciples, in verse 27, Went on, uh, went on the way to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." It's interesting, we're going to talk about the progression of this passage, but Jesus calls the crowd together and he says it's a call to discipleship, but the call to follow was a high one, right? The call to follow him was to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow. And for people in the crowd, they understood what Jesus was saying. The Romans had been crucifying criminals for a long, long time. They'd seen it. And the call, when he said, take up your cross and follow, they knew exactly the imagery and and the call that Christ was giving to them. And he makes this statement, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. One of the the great paradoxes 
of the New Testament. If you want to save, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel, Jesus says, will save it. And then he asks these rhetorical questions, right? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? It's a rhetorical question, meaning the answer is implied, right? What good is it to gain the whole world, to have everything your, your, uh, your heart's content, blessings upon blessings, riches upon riches? What good is it to gain the whole world yet forfeit your soul? And the answer is it's, 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 a, it's of no good. It's of no good. And he emphasizes it by another rhetorical question. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And the answer is nothing. In this we see a couple things. The immense worth of your soul. It is the most important part of you. It's the one, it's the thing, it's you. It's you created in the image of God. There's nothing you can give in exchange for your soul. And to pursue other things, to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul... It's not the way to go. Why would you do that? I remember when I was a kid playing soccer and we showed up for the game and the other team had six players. And in soccer, you know, it's 11 on 11. And uh, they said, well, and they were telling, we were nine, right? <laughs> I just watched Merv Griffin and then I came to the soccer game. We were nine, right? No. Uh, and, and they said, yeah, the other team has forfeited and then we're, not, and we're like, what does that mean? Well, they can't feel the team, so they lose. And you win. And at first we're like, we won? And there was a glimpse of like, hey, we won. And then it was like, well, that's, no, that's lousy, because what did we as nine-year-olds want to do? We wanted to play the game. So we ended up like saying, well, we'll give you, f we, we ended up giving them four of our players, and we played 10 on 10. Because we just wanted to play the game. And everybody got to play the whole time, and everybody won, right? But a forfeiting of the game means you, whatever you did, you lost. You lose. You, weren't, you didn't show up. You weren't present. They didn't come. Jesus is using this word. What is it, you know, what's it worth to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? I mean, to actually not show up, to actually hand it over, to chalk it up as a loss... Because why? You pursued other things. So it's, it's weighty, it's heavy, isn't it? That you can actually forfeit your soul. This is, this is Jesus speaking to the crowds and saying, if you want to be my disciple, this is what it means. Now what's interesting about this passage is the context of you know, Jesus with his disciples. Before he called the crowd, right? He asks his disciples, you know, who, who, do, who does the crowd, who do the people say that I am? Of course, John the Baptist, Elijah, and then that great question, who do you say that I am? And Peter, we can always count on Peter, to step up, to step in, and to speak out, and he said, you are the Messiah. And the truth was, he was right. You are the Messiah. And in a, a mere, in a few moments, you go from this place, from Peter saying, you are the Messiah, to Jesus saying to Peter, get behind me, Satan. It's such, a, it's such an um, amazing turn of events because Peter, right? Peter just come through with the right answer. And yet, in a few moments, he's going to be uh, kind of characterized with Satan. And Jesus saying, get behind me. Say, what happened in between time? Well, Jesus, after the confession of who Jesus was by Peter, he goes on to tell them about what's going to happen. And for Peter and certainly the other disciples, it just it did not compute because the Messiah was the anointed promised king who was going to come and reestablish Israel and certainly boot out the Romans who were so oppressive. And they were, Peter, I'm sure, it was like, man, we are in the inner circle of this Messiah king who's come to reign and to rule. And so when Jesus starts saying that we're gonna, we have to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer at the hands of the elders and going to be killed. Peter is the one. Verse 32 is one of the most stark and yet uh, kind of hilarious verses in the Bible. When, looking back on it, Jesus spoke plainly to them about what was going to happen. And then Peter, who had just answered brilliantly, 
this statement of faith, you are the Messiah, he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. (laughs) That's hilarious. To rebuke the Son of God, right? It shows where Peter was. It's like, no, no, no. You're the Messiah. I just proclaimed it. You're the Messiah. That doesn't happen to the the anointed, the king. And so he begins to say it's not going to happen. And this is where the get behind me Satan comes. Because Peter, Jesus even says it, you, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, Peter, but just human concerns. And this is where Peter was. Peter's concern was himself. He was concerned about, you know, uh, Jesus being the Messiah, Peter being on his team, all that it meant, what it meant for his family, what it meant for Israel. And so he rebuked Jesus, get behind me, Satan, because you're only thinking about what concerns human beings. God has other concerns. Salvation is going to come in other ways. And so uh, we see Peter just, he's, he's in it for himself. We see that. And while Peter was thinking of himself, Jesus was thinking not of himself. And if you know the, the gospel story of, of the days that came and the, the abuse that Jesus did undergo and the physical beating and the crucifixion. Crucifixion is the worst form of, of torture and um, um, the, you know, the killing of a human being that humanity has ever dreamed up, right? And he endured that for us. He did not have his own will first. He wasn't thinking of himself. Jesus was thinking of what God was concerned with And so he says it, you're only thinking of human concerns and not what God is concerned of. But the temptation was there for Jesus to avoid the cross. We know he didn't want to endure that. So it was a real temptation. Get behind me, Satan. Because Jesus was going to fulfill the reason that he came. And in this exchange, we are given the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to follow him and to have the priorities of God as our priorities. To follow Jesus means that what's important to God is important to us. Uh, we, we can begin to put our own concerns you know, ahead of that, but God's concerns come first. Now, the beauty of it is that God is very loving and kind and concerned for us. But if we put our desires, our concerns, what we want above what God wants, uh, your soul will languish and not flourish. Three weeks ago, I heard uh, a preacher uh, say this. It's stuck with me, obviously, ever since then. He's a uh, preacher, Rick Atchley, down in Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he made this comment. He said, in America today, uh, you can be a Christian and not follow Jesus. If, it, if it's like, that doesn't make sense to you, I'm glad it doesn't make sense to you. Because at first you're like, well, a Christian, even the word Christian means little Christ one. If you are a little Christ one, that means you're following Jesus. And if, you, if that's your understanding, keep that understanding, please do. But in America, there is a label called Christian, and you can be that label in America these days, and not actually follow Jesus. And I think he was right. I don't know how you're seeing things these days, but there are are waves and there are movements of uh, all kinds of natures and people doing things, and they put the label Christian on it. But when you look at it, it's like, how is this representing Jesus? This feels like human concerns over what God is concerned about. How is that possible? Well, it's possible. The truth is, every one of us here, if you were born into the United States of America, you are blessed, by the way. I mean, we should all thank God for the blessing of this nation and the freedoms that we have, to be sure. But we are not the ones who fought for it and earned it. And our, you know, our relatives, like sons and daughters, died for it. 
We didn't, we didn't go through the dangers of crossing the Atlantic for the purpose of religious freedom and then establish a country where people could be free to, to serve and to love God. We inherited all that, and when you inherit something like that, you don't appreciate it. And there are people today, this isn't even part of my sermon, what am I doing? There are people today who are experiencing the joy of a Christian nation and believing that it's their birthright, that they're somehow entitled to this nation of freedoms and being able to worship God. And they, they didn't do anything for it. Their parents didn't do anything for it. They just believe it's the way it is. And so they abuse it. May that not be us. Amen. May we follow Jesus. The people that established this nation, they were following Christ, not perfectly, but they were God-fearing people who wanted freedom for people. Why did they want freedom for all people? Because they had experienced, right? They experienced the chains of those who would rule over them and deny them the ability to, to follow God in a way that is honoring to him. So be careful and be mindful and look for the label that is Christian that is not following Christ because it's out here. It's for real. And don't be so quick to get sucked into the label. It's like, well, it's a Christian thing, so it must be what I need to give myself. No, you don't. You need to give your heart to Jesus and follow him. And if it true, turns out to be true and faithful and good, please absolutely give your time, energy, heart to those things. But if it's just a label because it's pursuing human concerns over God's concerns, see it for what it is and know that these are the days that we live in. So, if, so what is the first two then? Right? What, is, what is the purpose what it, for, of a flourishing soul? What, what is a flourishing soul for? The first and foremost answer is that your soul flourishing is for God. It is first for God. When your soul is doing well, then blessing and honor and glory goes to the Lord of all lords. Why? Because there is no other explanation. You cannot have a flourishing soul by human effort. It's only by God's presence, his power, his truth in your life where you can even pursue this and be a person who has a soul that is flourishing. You can be ones who say, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The lie that we get that comes against us, right? The lie that is from the pit of hell, honestly, is that if I give my life to God, I will be miserable, because I want to do what I want to do. If I give my life to know and to love and to serve God Almighty, I, I, I won't be able to do what I want to do. I won't be flourishing, and that's a lie. The truth is, the only way to flourish as a human soul is to walk in this imago Dei, this image of God. You are God's, you know, God's fingerprints are all over you. And he created you in his image. And as you flourish as a person, your day-to-day -day living is an act of worship to God because of what he has done. Your flourishing soul is first and foremost for God. It's what he receives through this salvation in Christ. And he loves it when his children flourish and when his concerns are above our own concerns. That's what's first. Second, your flourishing soul is for the blessing of other people. Before your own needs, the way, of, the way of Jesus teaches us, before my own needs, before I seek my own blessing, I look to be a blessing. And others will be blessed because my soul is doing well. What it means is that our souls will be on mission Glorifying God will mean that we are living for him. His concerns are ours. Jesus' priorities are our priorities. And I think that's a great definition of the church, quite honestly. The church ought to be a gathering of people who have declared allegiance to Jesus and to say his priorities are going to be our priorities. What's important to him is important to us. And if we say that, if we believe that, more importantly, if we live that out, people will be blessed. This neighborhood will be blessed. Our community will be blessed. 
right? The world, people will be coming to Jesus because we are people who have God's priorities. We've talked about a few weeks ago, the place of relationships and the first and second commandment, right? Jesus said the most important thing is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the purpose of your flourishing soul. And the second is like it, to love others as you love yourself. Other people, to put other people first. This is the way of Jesus. God so loves the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have ever lasting life, to be, to be souls on mission for God. That's the high purpose of a flourishing soul. In a couple of weeks, we're going to launch our blessed 2022 series, and it'll be a reminder for some, new for, for many of you, on, and, and, you know, what does a flourishing soul do? do what, what do we do? We, we love people to faith in Jesus. And it can seem so intimidating and so scary. We've, you know, we've boiled it down to, these are simple things that in obedience we can follow Jesus in and love people to faith. Because our lives, our flourishing souls, and collectively this church family, we exist for the benefit of people who are not yet here. Amen. We want them in heaven forever and ever. There are so many things we could give our time and our attention, our hearts, our resources to, but if it doesn't result in people being blessed into the kingdom, having their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and being with us for all eternity, why would we do that? Why would we do that? As the church, Jesus' priorities are our priorities, and through his teaching and through his life, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he's shown us what his priorities are. And that's the people that we live among. My friends, it takes disciples to make disciples. It takes flourishing souls, people who are winsome and who are just in love with God, to show other people in a dark and dreary world that there is beauty and there is light and there is hope. It takes someone experiencing the abundant life that Jesus came to bring us to lead them to this same abundant, flourishing life. That's what we need to be about. We exist for the benefit of others. So those are the first two. Our flourishing souls, what are they for? They're for the glory of God. Secondly, to benefit and bless other people. And then thirdly, absolutely, yes, our flourishing soul. Your flourishing soul will be a blessing to you. It will. And I want to say it again, while this is true, it's absolutely true. If you elevate this from the third position to the second, and certainly the first, your soul is going to languish. You can become so enamored with the goodness of God and the blessing of his life that you can forget it's for his glory. You can forget that it's for other people. You can become entitled and selfish to keep the, the flourishing soul as a blessing in your life in its rightful place is the only way to maintain flourishing, to avoid languishing. When Jesus says, uh, if you'll lose your life for me and for the gospel, it's setting this clear priority. Our, our lives are for him. We're to lose our lives for him. We're to lose our lives for, the, for his gospel, which the gospel is intended for the nations. So we give ourselves to it. it unless you lose yourself, Jesus' words, if you lose yourself for me and for the gospel, then you'll have real life. And we can trust him with this promise. It's in that way that we save our lives. You lose your life for him and the gospel, that's how you save your. You try to save your life. You try to hoard the blessing. If you don't give glory to God, you don't help other people love them as Jesus would, then that entitlement, will, you'll lose your life. You can forfeit your soul by that. The gospel of Jesus has come to us and it's given to us to share, not to hold on to. 
making disciples of the nations. It's what we're about. And it is the way of Jesus, and it is the pathway to flourishing. It brings glory to God. It blesses other people. And it brings wholeness to us when we find our life in God. I know it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to the flesh because your flesh, like mine, wants what it wants when it wants it, right? But the way of flourishing, you've gone down that road. You've gone down that road. You know the dead ends that come. The way of life in Jesus, the way to have a flourishing soul is to follow him. And that's, that's the invitation today, is to follow Jesus, to make his priorities your priorities, to not live for lesser things, but to live for Christ and to watch your soul flourish to honor God and be a blessing to other people. I ask the worship team to come, come on up. And, and I, uh, we're going to sing a song of commitment and invitation. And I just want to ask you if, you, you know, if following Jesus is what you're doing. How are you doing? Are there things, you know, are there priorities in your life where when you're honest, you say, those aren't his priorities. Jesus invites us to come and to follow him and to lose our lives for him, for the gospel. Then we will save them. We will save our lives by giving our lives away. He, of course, was the example, and uh, we, we would present Jesus to you. If you've never said yes to Christ, boy, why not today? Why not today? You could begin a life of living for him and knowing God through Jesus. You're, uh, he'll, he's the redeemer of hearts. He's the great physician. He begins to, you begin to find wholeness and healing as you walk with him. What would keep you from accepting Jesus today and allowing his lordship to rule over your life? You have questions, of course, and you're sitting among people who are working this out, you know, but we hope you'll ask the questions, and if we can help you or pray for you, um, we, that's why we're here. So let's, uh, let's use this song to dedicate ourselves, to communicate to the Lord, we're all in. We accept the invitation. We, we will follow you. In the good times, in the difficult times, we will follow you. Would you stand and let's sing together? Mm-hmm.